Everything that I know about Nagash comes from Pancreas's other video that he did on Cetra. My impression of this guy is that he kind of wants to be, you know, that guy, but he's never actually beaten Cetra. However, somehow, because of lore <laughs> and, uh, well, the end times, he ended up winning in the end. Not exactly the greatest guy out there, but what I will say is that I did look up his figurine in Age of Sigmar, and... That does look pretty cool. In Warhammer Fantasy, something about the good guy characters is that even when they do horrid things, they do it out of the love for their people and nation that they have. Karl Franz, Teclas, even some evil characters like Lev von Karstein do some pretty dark things out of wanting their people to survive and prosper. They genuinely believe these things are a necessary evil to survive they in the horrid world that they live Carl. in. They try to be good people despite the cards they've been dealt, oftentimes forcing them to do dark acts. With that in mind, there's something to be said about a character who is just an unrelenting piece of shit that <laughs> Every turn for no better reason than because why not? No, this isn't another. Okay. I mean, I love Dio. <laughs> I mean, we all love to hate Dio from JoJo's. And he's just kind of, you know, evil for evil's sake sometimes. So, yeah, I mean, I get that. Like, the villain characters can be cool. Uh, there's always uh, something to be said about, like, a v very well written villain with clear motivations that anybody can really understand. But, you know, sometimes just. Villainy. <laughs> Just the act of being evil can also be pretty fun. Their video about the Skaven, though they will feature in it. Allow me to tell you the story of Nagash, Warhammer's biggest douchebag. Nagash was born in ancient Hecara thousands upon thousands of years before Warhammer fantasy mostly takes place. He was the first son okay. of the reigning ruler, which at first makes you probably think, oh, he's gonna be doing great. He'll be king and all that good stuff. And in literally mm -hmm. any other kingdom, you'd be right. But in Hecara, the firstborn son doesn't become king. It's the secondborn one. The firstborn is stuck Why? being sent off to join the mortuary cult to learn all about death and keeping packs with the Hecarim gods and all that stuff I that see. doesn't involve ruling with unlimited power. And Nagash hated it. He was a sociopathic dickhead from day one and wanted to be king. There was, however, a brief moment in time where his father Katap led a military campaign against Elizaman but fell ill, whereupon Nagash took over the campaign for him and briefly ruled a city he saved as a king for six months. This happened before he was forced to join the mortuary okay. cult, so not only did he get power taken away from him, now he had a taste of what he could have had if he was born just a bit later. Oh. And there it is. That's where, well, he kind of wasn't a, the greatest guy ever since the beginning, yeah. But he got that taste. And with whatever newfound power or understanding of death that this guy gained from, like, his studies and being sent off and whatnot, oh, he's going to use that. Also, his dad removed all records of him actually doing the ruling of the city and leading the campaign and just had him referred to Yikes. as a brave warrior. Bit of a dick move, but given what Nagash is going to be getting up to shortly, probably not undeserved. Thankfully, yeah, during his father's yeah. funeral, a solution to all his problems was practically handed to him on a silver platter. Diplomats from another kingdom arrived with three dark elf prisoners to be given to Zandri in Nagash's kingdom as a sacrifice. Nagash promptly went, I assure you, everyone, I can handle it from here. And is that Nagash's old figurine? That's actually kind of funny. <laughs> the new updated designs look so much better. But I guess there's also, I don't know, this cute nostalgic charm to it. Like, I can't even use the word nostalgic because I wasn't there for it. But you can tell from the design that it's from a, a time in the past where things were just a little, little, I don't really know the word to use here. A little clunkier, a little... A little charming. <laughs> it's like that feeling that you get when you play a, a really good but old game that isn't very refined and yet you're having just so much fun with it. Reminding you of older times despite you not having never played that game as a kid before stole them away when he was embalming his dad's corpse he realized that dark magic must have played a part in his death and he correctly assumed that the three pointy-eared assholes in front of him were at least somewhat responsible so he stuck them in his dad's pyramid filled the entire thing with lethal traps and whatnot and told them they can either teach him magic or join his father in the grave naturally Bruh. they decided to help him though being elves they of course made sure to tell him that he was still inferior the entire time not that he gave a shit he of got course. that spicy forbidden knowledge either way he learned how to do magic without relying on the gods all about chaos and the fun stuff that entails, and that if a human is extra careful, they can use one of the winds of magic. Of course, not all of it at once, like the elves, but hey, better than nothing. Eventually, the Dark mm. Elves, of course, managed to escape, but right as they got to the exit, they found good old Nagy waiting for them. He told them that they either had to beat him in a magical duel to escape or get back in that tomb, so help them, and the elves figured, we're elves, we got this. But in fact, they did not have this, and Nagash ate all of their souls. And this Yikes. is where things really started to go well for Nagash, and poorly for everyone who isn't Nagash. As a quick side note, though, those three elves were also involved in the false flag.
flag operation that started the massive war between the High Elves and the Dwarfs. So if you ever wondered oh. how the hell all of the horrible things of the Warhammer world managed to come to power, including Nagash, it's because Malekith and his dami mommy threw a hissy fit powerful enough to destabilize nations. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know a, a little bit about that civil war and like all oh, just this weird false flagging as uh, pancreas put it i think even the war between the elves and the dwarves happened because of some sort of plot people pulling strings behind the scenes Nagash, he commensurated his newfound power by murdering his brother's court and burying him alive. Already off to Very a nice. fantastic start, he began to get really into his magical research. He invented necromancy. Well, I mean, all right, not technically, invented? but he was the first one to make meaningful progress with it. Meaningful progress here, okay. meaning potions of eternal life and entire armies of undead soldiers. Let no. Oh, well. I guess you have to give credit where credit is due. Nagash clearly understood death very, very well. I wouldn't say he doesn't get shit done. He did almost the whole evil magic shebang. Mass sacrifices, torture, kidnapping people to sacrifice and torture. The only thing I don't think he did was make packs with dark gods, because then he wouldn't be the one in charge. He wrote nine books, creatively called the Nine Books of Nagash, which, fair enough, I guess. <laughs> These contained the secrets of all he had learned, though because he put a portion of himself in each of them, only he could get the full power out of them. Why he needed to get the power out of the books he wrote, I don't know but I guess even without the knowledge, they're still incredibly powerful magic artifacts, so gotcha. maybe that's why. Or just because he's a dick. That's always a good reason to go for when you're talking about True. Nagash. Then he started his trend of building massive black pyramids, at least partially made out of warp stone. First, he bankrupted Kemri building it, not only wasting the treasury, but thousands of lives on top of that. Then he figured that if he was going to build this, he might as well full send it and did pretty much the same thing to all of Nehekara. Eventually, no one could stomach him turning their once mighty nation into a continent-sized decaying remnant of what once was, so basically the city of Chicago scaled up. Up, so they all rebelled. Nagash responded by raising a massive army of the dead and then killing his wife, who for the record was his brother's wife before he murdered his brother. He was also- Oh my god, Nagash. We're doing every single villainy that you can possibly think of in the book. <laughs> So abusive and probably sexually assaulted her because at this point there were only so many ways to make him even more of a shitbag the writers probably just felt obliged to cross that off the list despite yeah, all this he assumed yeah. no one was actually going to challenge him once he rose to power surely no one was dumb enough to do Unless... that he was very wrong and the armies of seven tomb kings cast him out of power and murdered all of his lieutenants turns out a seven nation army could hold them back who knew of course he slipped away like the weasel he is and they couldn't destroy his pyramid but hey he's gone sure the land's in crippling debt famine the gods are pretty much gone because Nagash killing his wife broke an ancient pact and barbarians from everywhere else are raiding across the land willy-nilly but, hey, but at least, at least he's the gone. big bad was defeated once and for all it turns Unless... out the big bad wasn't defeated once and for all nagash wandered in the desert for a little while kind of like moses but evil at one point he died but he decided that dying evil is cringe moses. so he just possessed his body and kept on walking he saw i feel like that's a running theme here in the warhammer fantasy universe it's like Lord Croak also basically died and was like, yeah, uh, I'm not really all about this dying thing. <laughs> Although, of course, like Lord Croak is a slant mage and Nagash was some dude. So I, I guess the feats are not exactly equal. But I suppose if you want to be this much of a dick, you kind of have to have the power to back it up. Some Skaven, murdered some Skaven, and then took a bite out of the warp stone they had on him. Instantly, two of things course. happened from this. One, it was like he ate a Senzu bean and recovered a pretty sizable portion of his power. And two, okay. his senses got all screwed up like that one scene from Gravity Falls where the guy has an eyeball for a mouth and he just kind of watered the desert aimlessly. What is going on in Gravity Falls? I don't think I've ever seen an episode of that show, but I know it's about, like, occult stuff. Weird. <laughs> for over a century. To fast track things a little bit, after that little oopsie, he found a human tribe living on a mountain. He saw how they were mining warp stone, took it over, and then turned it into a magical fortress called... Seriously? Nagash's are. Because of... <laughs> <laughs> okay, look. The man's evil. That doesn't mean he's created with names. Of course, that's what he called it. He fought some Skaven to a standstill and made a truce with them, which neither side expected to last for more than five minutes, then made not only his evil armor, but his crown of sorcery. The armor is whatever, you know, it's just standard evil bad guy armor. But okay. the crown is important, and it'll show up later. By this point, vampires gotcha. started bothering him, because someone else found his formula for eternal life, but couldn't get the recipe quite right. The first time someone tried to contact him, he magically strangled them from a continent away. But eventually, he figured these super powerful really? undead might make for some good minions and recruited them to his cause. He also may have been guiding them the whole time, but either way, he's got his new lieutenants and decided that he'd take another cr How powerful is Nagash? Like, I know he becomes some sort of, like, chaos god in Age of Sigmar, but even before then, like, force choking somebody uh, across the continent? Is that something even Darth Vader would be able to do? 
Well, probably. I guess we just never saw that in a movie. Or, well, I never saw it, correction. I don't very little about Star Wars lore. There is so much to explore there that we have yet to even touch upon. Prakina Hekara, and so he did. And a lot of people died. Like, a lot. His forces started wreaking havoc, and the chief king of the realm, Akadi Zar, was taken from his throne and imprisoned by Nagash. And then the skelly man decided it was time to up the ante. How, you might ask? Why, by casting a spell that would resurrect every last corpse on the planet under his control. All of them. Every? Ever. This was after not only the Great wow. Chaos Invasion, but the massive war between elves and dwarfs, as well as the elven civil war and Malekith's hissy fit. So there were a few corpses lying around. The stakes have risen yeah. somewhere into the stratosphere by this point, and what didn't help was that Nagash, while doing this, decided to kill every single living being in the Hecara first just to piss off Alkadizar. <sighs> Alkadizar also Man. needed to be alive as a focus for the power of the spell. Since he ruled in the Hecara, he would serve as a symbol for everything in it to focus on so Nagash could murder everything in it. But I have no okay. doubt in my mind Nagash mostly just kept him alive to be a shit heel. But he forgot about one <laughs> crucial detail. Those goddamn rat people. They realized that every corpse on the planet included Skaven corpses, which are always plentiful, and that either way, world domination would include wiping them out. So the Skaven freed El Zar, gave him a dagger made of pure warp stone that started killing him the moment he touched it, and told him to go stab the guy at the center of a hurricane of magic. And right as everything but he and Nehekaro was dead, including the plant life, he cut off Nagash's hand. He wasn't dead, but at least nice. the spell hadn't gone global. And thus did an epic battle for the fate of the world begin, in which the Skaven were actually using magic the whole time to help Akadizar because that's how afraid they were of Nagash. He made Skaven willingly wow. work with other people and not screw them over because of how afraid they were of him. Je that's... yeah. That is a feat. You're so bad of a bad guy that the Skaven are afraid of you, and so they end up working with the good guys. It just goes to show you that, like, the Skaven could achieve a lot, if they could ever organize under a particular cause, which uh, unfortunately happened during the end times, but the reason for that was kind of meh. Jesus, fuck. Epic battle occurs and ends. I'm sure there's some stuff to say in it, but I mean, it's an epic fantasy battle. The good guy ends mm -hmm. in the win. What the fuck did I just yeah. say? Nagash is dead, but so is Nehekara. Of course, since losing his hand caused Nagash to have an oopsie whoopsie with the spell, all of the Nehekarans that died in the past came back with varying levels of sentience. The Tomb King started infighting, and now there's all sorts of claims to the throne and a whole ton mm. of shit going down. There but that's is. irrelevant. Nagash is gone now, and this time the good guys actually beat the big bad gone for, for certain, even if it was at a measurable cost. Definitely this time. He's definitely gone. It definitely. turns out that Nagash was not actually gone. He basically no, invented necromancy. Are you surprised? I mean, seriously. No, of course he was very weakened, both from the sword and from the souls of all the people he killed, beating the shit out of him in the afterlife. So it took him... <laughs> Is that how that works? Well, Nagash. I wonder how... Well, I was gonna say I wonder how he survived that, but he was already dead, so... 1,111 years to finally come back again. When he did come back, he had to find all of his magical stuff, and he had to reforge his hand since al cut mm -hmm. it off, but hey, he's back. Unfortunately, he was unlucky enough to come back to life at the same time as Sigmar Unbroken, the still Ooh. just a man, the myth, the legend himself. And Sigmar, being a big fan of smashing things with his hammer, proceeded to smash Nagash with his hammer. To be fair, <laughs> he had to wear Nagash's crown after he found it in order to resist Nagash's magic, but he still won. I mean, he's Sigmar. Of course he won. He's mm. the best god emperor and the second best Emperor and Warhammer. And now Nagash was <laughs> definitely gone. For certain. Absolutely. For sure. definitely, definitely gone. It turns out that Nagash was... Yeah, he's not gone, alright? Of course, this time it took a lot longer for him to come back. His spirit did kind of influence some stuff and quietly direct things for a few thousand years, and more directly okay. guide Arcan, but he didn't do too much otherwise. And then the end times happened. Naturally, the big man was due for a comeback tour. He started it by resurrecting himself by having Arcan sacrifice Tyrion and Alariel's daughter, the Fae Enchantress, and Volkmar the Grim. Presumably several oh. thousand other peasants and such as well on top of them, because this lich cannot do anything without being a prick about it. He shows back up oh. on all of his his pointy hatted glory and literally everyone on the planet including the chaos gods start shitting their pants because this time around he ate the god of the dead and caused the dead around the world to resurrect now that he's back yeah. first order of business obliterate Nehekara, which he promptly did such did put up a fight and say the most badass line in all of warhammer history but <laughs> well yeah yeah that was a very badass line and one that uh I, we will not voice because we cannot do it justice. He still got exploded by Nagash in the end. After he was done with revenge about 10,000 years in the making, Nagash drained the power of the dwarf god Valaya because one god clearly wasn't enough for him. Then he brings all of the undead on the planet under his control and starts forcing the entire wind of death into Sylvania. By this point, he decided that it was safe for him to take a bit of a breather, so he decided to chill in his coffin for a while. Also, remember the black pyramid he built? He floated it all the way to Sylvania. Imagine picking up the great... 
Where is Sylvania? Maybe I should recognize this name, but I can't really, really think of it. There's been a lot of lore that we've gone through, so uh, I've probably forgotten bits and pieces here and there. Pyramids of Giza and floating them over to Romania only doubled the distance because the Warhammer world is huge. He used it to start becoming even more powerful, but he once again made a massive mistake. He forgot he existed on the same planet as the Skaven. By this point, the Skaven had decided to become <laughs> part of Chaos because the writers needed the end times to happen eventually, yeah. and that was a good way to do it. A massive demon army led by a traitorous lieutenant of his shows up, and while it was held back thanks to Nagash's power, the Skaven sneaked on under to the pyramid and blew it up with magical nuclear warheads. Understandably a little bit annoyed, he destroyed every single demon little the field with one massive blast of magic. Then realizing that between blowing his load too early and with his pyramid gone, he had no way to achieve godhood in time, so he reluctantly went to ally with the living. Teclis did try to get him on their side a while ago, but Nagash was still up his own ass and turned him down, and also probably disintegrated the elf he sent to ask him. Also, another quick side note, but how he hadn't achieved godhood after devouring two entire gods is an excellent example of Games Workshop's writing ability. Anyway, yeah, right? You have the power of two gods within you, and yet you can't be a god? <laughs> hmm, I don't know if that logic follows, but whatever. Maybe they have an explanation for it. Teclis asking Nagash, of all people, for help kind of shows how desperate he must have been in the moment. Like, I don't know if I would ever consider asking Nagash for anything, considering his track record, but... Desperate times call for desperate measures. He goes to Athaloran to meet up with the other incarnates of the Winds of Magic, and they barely managed to squeak out an alliance. To seal the deal, he gave Manfred to the living as a sort of prisoner exchange, which was pretty funny. Manfred is even like, hey, wait, what the hell, man, before getting put in a box or something. He also mocks Tyrion and Ilariel for not being to save their daughter and prevent his resurrection, because of course he does. During negotiations, mm. Chaos shows up to stop the alliance, and Nagash brutalizes anything chaotic in front of him, and solos a bloodthirster. Nagash, giant douchebag, but great in a fight. Everyone's still alive, teleports yeah, Middenheim yeah. to stop Chaos from overtaking the world, and Nagash continues on as he has and one-shots anything stupid enough to get in front of him before resurrecting their corpse. See, this is why I love him, or at least love to hate him. He's such an unrepentant asshole, but he does it with such style that I'm still happy he's around. During the fight, he eventually <laughs> fought Kabanda the Bloodthirster, which acquired a bit more effort out of him. First, he had to choke him out like a bitch before erasing him from the world. <laughs> Dang, dude. Yeah, at the very least, you gotta respect Nagash's combat ability. But you do have to remember, right, that Nagash isn't, uh, you know, part of the Chaos factions. Or rather, like, not a follower of the, the four Chaos gods. He's kind of just a bad person <laughs> in general. But he's got his own thing going on and his own interest, and they don't align with that of the, the four Chaos gods. So it would make sense to team up with the good guys this time in order to at least have a, a world that he can conquer rather than completely erasing it but yeah we know what happens at the end of end times anyways so i wonder how nagash takes advantage of that because i know he's just even more powerful in age of sigmar as the climax of the battle is coming up, they go to stop the Chaos Rift from overtaking the world and then uh oh manfred decided that now is the time to betray everyone and supreme no Oh, man. Manfred, why do you do this? <laughs> Could you not? <laughs> well, like, uh, I don't know, man. We've already had this discussion before during the End Times video. We've kind of already established with lore that these leaders are willing to do evil things for the sake of their own people. And I mean, like, it, it's understandable, right? But here... I don't know if this benefits the vampires in any way. Stabs Gelt in the back. Tyrion stabs Manfred in the back in return, but it's too late. As the world is overtaken by chaos, mm. Nagash loses all of his magic and is last seen crumbling the dust while panicking. And thus Rip. does the story of Nagash come to a close. Or Definitely. does it? It yeah. turns out that I have about three jokes to work with per video because I am not clever or funny, and also that Nagash's story did not come to a close. After the world exploded, Chaos stuck him in a crypt of forgotten moments after the end times, which sounds like some BS nothing, but whatever. Sigma huh. Crypt of forgotten moments? Is that its actual name, or maybe Pancreas is just kind of paraphrasing? It just feels like another excuse to bring back Nagash so we can sell his figurines in Age of Sigmar. Which, I mean... I'm fine with, like, Nagash is a pretty good villain character. But still, like, you bring back Nagash, but not Setra? <laughs> hmm, I don't know about that one, Chief.
Or freeze him to help him restart reality, and they start beating the snot out of monsters even the Chaos Gods were afraid to mess with. And he's a god too now. He's finally moving up in the world. Except now he has seven other incarnate gods to deal with of roughly equal strength to him on top of the Chaos Gods. He did pimp slap Marathi when she tried to sleep with him though, so at least his treatment of women hasn't changed after all these years. <laughs> Well, respectable. Then again, it's Marathi, and if there was ever an elf that deserved to be slapped upside the head over and over, it's definitely her. He immediately begins planning to betray Sigmar and everyone else, because at this of point, course. I'm pretty sure being an asshole is a core part of his soul or something. Speaking of souls, he also claims all the souls of those who die is belonging to him on the basis of do trust me on this one. That's why he really hates Sigmar now, because the Stormcasts get reforged, and he only gets a sliver of their soul each time they die. But I get- Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. That is the lore behind the, the Stormcast Eternals, where yeah, they can resurrect, but each time they die, they lose a small part of their soul. So one of those Stormcast Eternals could be like a character that we know, but at this point, depending on how many times they've died, like, are they really the same person anymore? Ahead of myself, negotiate all the other di <sighs> fucking diabetes, man. Negotiate all of the other death <laughs> gods, which somehow still didn't boost his power above everyone else, because Nagash can never win. Chaos invaded, and Nagash is actually the last one of Sigmar's pantheon to leave him. Unsurprisingly, on his way out, he basically kicks Sigmar in the balls by leaving his forces to rot while Chaos runs rampant, and Nagash goes back home to the realm of death. Somehow, having not have expected this, Sigmar is thoroughly sick of his shit by this point and runs to Shyish to beat the hell out of him. But was so mad, he kind of forgot about the whole chaos invasion running rampant thing going on. Sigmar loses the mm. battle because Archeon tricked him and made him get rid of Galmaraz, and everything goes super grim and dark and looks like Games Workshop is gonna end times AOS before it even begins. Nagash tries to solo Archeon, gets a shit- Hmm. There is a lot of lore that I'm learning about Age of Sigmar here. We haven't explored any of it at all. And I have seen comments about people talking about how they enjoyed the lore of Age of Sigmar, but, you know, It'll kind of always be overshadowed by the fact that Age of Sigmar came about because of a completely horrible way to handle your franchise with end times. Still, I wouldn't be opposed to like doing lore videos and learning about some unique factions that come from Age of Sigmar. It pushed in and then goes to pout in a corner and wait for someone else to handle chaos, because that's a good idea. But the people who grow stronger through rampaging violence have free reign of the universe to rampage and be violent with. I see yes. no way this can go wrong. This is a stellar idea. Not a flaw in sight for this plan. Thankfully for Nagash though, Sigmar shows back up with the Stormcast not too long after all this. Of course, once he's back, he doesn't team up with Sigmar, this time because he thinks he can handle chaos on his own after he had some time to really? meditate and gain power or whatever. Once again, he fights everything. K on and take a guess how the fight goes. Hazard a guess. Go on. You'll never believe it. And uh, yeah, Nagash loses again. What a surprise. <laughs> At least he didn't get his body destroyed this time. He just pushed out like a bitch. He also hates the Island of the Deepkin for stealing souls, Celeste and the various mm. elf gods for basically not just handing elf souls over to him, and everyone else for having the gall to not just die and let him be in charge for all of eternity. What Pancreas's video on the Deepkin, I think they're called, has been suggested to me before, so... Yeah, I'll check it out someday. From what I know, they seem to be a unique faction to Age of Sigmar. And uh, apparently the lore is pretty cool. What a guy. Oh, and he also started building pyramids again. Several of them this time, so he can make a ritual to drain all magic into Why his realm and down? once again be able to kill everything everywhere. Say what you want about this sociopathic asshole, but he's very determined and certainly has a sense of showmanship. The Chaos Gods True. themselves even popped by to watch all this go down. And at first it was going pretty well. And then the pyramids all blew up. Oh boy, I wonder what oh. race of people could have done that. Yeah, he oh. also doesn't <laughs> learn from his mistakes. Like, <gasps> ever. At first he was laughing at the Chaos oh, Gods no. saying he'd overtake them. Then they laughed at him for being so stupid to let the exact same thing as before happened to him, only this time scaled up, and then he started laughing again because he still considered it a success. Turns out the ritual failing still made a magical black hole that drained magic towards its center that he could kind of go into for a bit and absorb power. Also it caused the awesome okay. necroquake which enveloped all of reality and death magic and started making spooky ghosts pop up all over the place. He also unveiled the oh. Osir Bone Reapers. But dude, look at this. You have to admit that at least the figurines look really really good. And yeah, Pancreas did just mention the I Osiric? I don't I think that's how you pronounce that. Uh the Bone Reapers. Who have kind of replaced the Tomb Kings, which is a little unfortunate because I really like the, the Tomb King aesthetic. But uh, they are doing their own thing, so yeah, uh, I'll check out a video on these guys at some point later. 
Marines, which are the undead space marines to Sigmar's fantasy space marines. So for undead a little bit, space it marines. looked like okay. Nagash was actually making Basically. meaningful progress. Then Teclis dispelled the Necroquake and blew Nagash right the hell up. Arkan got chucked into the void of magical <laughs> light light that is the outskirts of the realm of light, and also Elario cast our own super magic ritual that dispelled most of what death magic was left across the mortal realms. He just can't okay. catch a break, can he? Now he's once again reduced to not having a body and has less control over his minions than ever before. And thus, have we finally reached the end of the story of Nagash, the great have necromancer. We? Definitely. For real this ha time. Have Certainly. we? Absolutely. Really? At least until he oh. gets his body back together. What? I just called him the great necromancer. You gotta stop falling for this gag. Anyway, there's the story, but why don't we end off with some rules and such? A sort of mini do or don't, yeah? Lore wise, take Nagash okay. if you wanna have gotcha. the end all be all boss of your. I mean, since they're bringing back fantasy, then I suppose they're gonna bring back Nagash as well. I haven't looked into it. I don't know how they're bringing back fantasy. Is this just going to be like an, an offshoot of like, oh, what if the end times didn't happen? Or are they just like restarting the whole thing, making it its own thing, but like with the same characters? I wonder why I never asked this before. Hmm. I guess the thought just never popped to my mind. Faction on the tabletop, and if you want someone who's just straight up an evil dickhead, then there's no better choice for you. Plus, he's undead, and the undead and Warhammer yeah, are fun. awesome. No sparkling vampire BS here, just fangs, evil magic, and a whirlwind of violence. Imagine putting mm. Ainz from Overlord on the table, only not pathetic in all ways, but his power level. Nagash hams it up at every moment, and if you want a villain that steals the show because of how unnecessarily evil he is, here you go. As for his rules, well, he's the god of the dead. Unlike how he is in the lore. If you guys haven't seen Overlord, you definitely should. Anyways, uh, I'm gonna take a second here to, to look this over. Or he's no goddamn pushover here. 16 wounds, 10 bravery, 9 inches of movement, and a 3 plus save means that he's faster than Eldar infantry and he's gonna tank almost whatever you throw at him. He can cast faster an abide up to 9 spells, degrading down to a minimum of 4 if you take away 13 wounds, which good luck with that. Naturally, he gets a bonus to casting an unbinding spells because he's the god of death, and to put it bluntly, you're joining his domain whether you like it or not. He has a ranged weapon in the form of his death glare, which causes d6 wounds because he's such a stone cold motherfucker, and 3 different <laughs> melee weapons to choose from. Just just to really put the hurt on. His melee weapons hit pretty hard, not the hardest in the game, and anything next to him is certainly gonna be feeling it. Of course, as is fitting for a necromancer, his magic is what you really want him for. He knows all the spells mm. for the undead faction army he joins, and he can't join any of them since, again, he's their god. But let's just look at his personal abilities for the baseline I level see. of BS he can always unleash. He can either heal 15 wounds worth of damage or bring back 15 models from the dead, depending on what he's casting on. In a war game where chaff units are incredibly useful for tying down the enemy until they're inevitably destroyed and can make or break a game depending on how they're used, Nagash simply says, no, these skeletons are not going to be leaving the table. He can give a unit a boost to their ward save when it's the combat phase. On a roll of six for a saved wound, he reflects it right back at the person who was trying to hurt him. Soul Stealer lets him brutalize enemy units and heal himself in turn, so if you don't kill him in a single turn, he's just gonna come right back to full health. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't really know anything about the tabletop game a, a lot of these numbers and terms kind of go over my head a little bit but at the very least i can tell that this guy is going to be very annoying to deal with if you're playing against him and of course my personal favorite hand of dust within three inches of him pick a model if you successfully cast the spell and you're almost certainly going to especially if he's unwounded take a dice and put it in one of your hands behind your back if they don't pick the hand with the dice in it the model is just dead no ward save no retreating what? just gone reduced to atoms if they don't have a rule that's more or less specifically designed to prevent this from happening like Gotrek or Archeon, they simply cease to be. I absolutely Bro. love how this isn't just roll a dice and on a four if they die, because functionally that's the same thing. They make it so you have to pick which hand it's in, which just makes me imagine some stupid Death Note level mind games going on. Like the player using the gash <laughs> is like, he knows I picked my right hand last time I used this and will be expecting my left hand. Thus, I'll use my right hand once more. And the other guy's like, I know he picked his right hand, so surely it would be in his left now, oh, but he no. might be expecting me to know that, so he must surely have put it in his right hand again. But I've seen in comments that there are sometimes like some really fun rules as well as just some dumb rules like this, which you can have because it's a tabletop game. And so having your players do different things is just kind of how it's handled. But there's also been just some downright silly rules. Like I think specifically for like Bretonia, I don't remember exactly what they made you do within their rule book. And it felt more like 
GW just wasn't respecting their players and making them do silly things. What if he expects me to assume this and moved it to his left because of this? It's such a stupid little thing, but it's just fun to me to imagine it going down like that. There's no rolling, you have to play the Games Workshop mandated mind games. Anyways, lore flaws. He's a douchebag, so by picking Nagash, you are forfeiting any rights you have to the moral high ground. Yes, even mm. if your opponent is the Skaven or Chaos, all that does is make everyone equally an asshole. Of course, that has its own appeal, but if you aren't looking for the absolute bottom of the ethical barrel, then don't go for Nagash. Also, as you may have noticed, Nagash loses a lot in his lore. True, a lot of this is because he's the god of the well, dead, and, and lore, therefore just resurrects yeah. himself later, but it still makes him look like a bit of a punk. So while the numberless horde of undead angle has your back, the leader of that numberless horde gets his nose bloodied a lot more often than not. I guess he doesn't lose as often as the Skaven do, but it's funny and destructive when they lose, whereas it's just kind of pathetic whenever Nagash loses once again. <laughs> as for rules, there are still some flaws he has, despite what he's got going for him. That degrading stat line means he gets worse as time goes on, and if you aren't careful, that oh. just means that you might throw him into a situation without realizing he's no longer prepared for it. Soul Stealer can I help see. mitigate this, but you still shouldn't put him into a melee fight with Gotrick or Archaeon. Not that I should have yeah. to tell you to avoid getting into a melee fight with Gotrick. That's like telling yeah, someone right? don't stare at the sun for too long. And while <laughs> I mean, Nagash is a necromancer, so it makes sense that his kid is built around, you know, necromancy, spells. Being a melee lord is not his thing. His wounds and save do make him tanky, cannons are gonna grind him into bone meal. Artillery of any sort is the bane of his existence because they reduce his save and make it so that his wounds almost don't matter. Because with enough d6 damaging shots, it's not gonna matter if he makes one or two of those saves. Additional- Hmm, it reduces saves. Interesting. So, different unit types also have different effects that they can apply. You'd probably have to have like this huge stat sheet or I guess just a piece of paper to record all the status effects on all of your units and like what's currently going on. Only certain casters are going to make him look almost useless, namely Teclas. If your opponent is running Teclas, just forfeit. While Teclas can only cast half as many spells, he has a guaranteed casting value of 10 minimum, so whatever he's shooting is going off. This is on top of Teclas being able to auto unbind one spell per turn and make it just not happen. True, if Nagash gets into melee range of any caster, he's going to send them straight to Shyesh, Teclas included, but if he can't, the upper tier ones are going to make him look a bit silly. And given that there's decent mm. odds there'll be an entire battle line between Nagash and the enemy magic man, well... He also doesn't really buff- mm. Okay. From that, I can pick up that when you cast a spell, there's a chance that it doesn't go off depending on the roll, but with Teclas, it looks like no matter what you cast, it will go off. Because he's like, you know, the best at magic whereas his brother is like the best at melee. So I mean, so far his lore, Nagash's lore, does match up with his tabletop power level, I guess you could say. He's a necromancer, he's not a melee lord, he's better at melee than other pure casters, but he's also not the best at magic. His army, so you're bringing Nagash for Nagash and not to help out other units, healing aside. Mm. Lastly, his price. 955 points means that if you aren't playing a large scale game, he's just not showing up. Like, at least Big Turtle could show up in a game under 1500 points and feasibly not tank the army to uselessness, but Nagash will do just that. And even in larger gotcha. point games, you are paying out the ass for him. He's almost certainly going to make up half, if not more, of your points allowance, so if you use him, you really need to know how to make the most out of the guy. And with that, I am finally, for real, done talking about Nagash. Warhammer's okay. biggest douchebag. There's a whole list of things he's done solely to be a prick, mm. but I'm not gonna list all of them. If you want, though, go to 1d4chan. At the bottom of his page is a list of the various things he's done for no reason beyond being petty and evil. It's a long list. As always, thank you to my <laughs> wonderful channel members. You are the books of Nagash to my Nagash, um, allowing me to continue to Nagash the times as to Nagash, such as the power of Nagash. <laughs> if you'd like to support the channel, feel free to become a member or subscribe. Theoretically, hitting like also helps me, but I've yet to discover Theoretically. how. Theoretically. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. That's what YouTube says, but... Nagash, Nagash, Nagash? Nagash. Nagash, Nagash. Ah, but Nagash? Mmm, Nagash, Nagash, Nagash. Nagash? Eh, Nagash. Nagash.